Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, distinguished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen. I hope all of you are in good health and ready to dive into the discussion on a very excellent topic, which is about the role of carbon capture, utilization, and storage, or in short CCUS, in low-carbon development in ASEAN. My name is Gabriela Inanto. I'm the Associate Officer of Power, Fossil Fuel, Alternative Energy, and Storage, Department at the ASEAN Center for Energy, and I will be the master of ceremony for today's webinar. We will start the webinar today with welcoming remarks from two great leaders from ASEAN Center for Energy and Energy Commission Malaysia, which is then followed by a keynote speech. Unfortunately, His Excellency Mr. Arifin Tasrif, the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources of Indonesia, will not be able to join us today as he has another urgent agenda. In his place, he appointed Professor Insinyur Tutuka Arya Jin, MSc, PhD, IPU, the Director General of Oil and Gas from the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources Indonesia to deliver the keynote speech on his behalf. We have such amazing live speakers that will share their knowledge and experience during the panel discussion later. At the end of the panel discussion, there will be a Q&A session with the audience. I would like to encourage all participants to raise your questions at any time in the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. The moderator will then convey all your questions to the panelists during the Q&A session. Before we get started, please allow me to inform you on some guidelines for our webinar today. First, all of the speakers should ensure there will not be any background noises, and I would suggest everyone to put your devices on silent mode. Second, all speakers should mute their microphones and only unmute if they wish to present or speak. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Nuki Agia Utama, the Executive Director of the ASEAN Center for Energy, to deliver the first welcoming remark. Please, Dr. Nuki, the time is yours. Um, thank you very much, Kedi. Uh, Your Excellencies, Professor Insinyur Tutuka Aryaji, the Director General of Oil and Gas, Ministry of Energy and Minerals Resources of Indonesia, Dato Mr. Abdul Rajib Dawood, the Chief Executive Officers of Energy Commission Malaysia, and also the ASEAN Forum on Coal Chairman. Distinguished colleagues, guests, and participants, a perfect morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are look, um, staying. I hope that everybody is doing well, stay safe and stay healthy. On behalf of the ASEAN Center for Energy, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to today's webinar with the title, the Role of Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage, or CCUS, in Low Carbon Development in ASEAN. According to the our flagship report, the ASEAN Plan of Export Energy Cooperation 2016-2025 Phase 2, 
which is released in November 2020, ASEAN has the strategies to optimize the development of clean coal technology, or CCT, in program area number three. And this is also to pursue the region's energy transition towards sustainable and lower emission development, which align with the Paris Agreement. And also in the 38th ASEAN Ministers on Energy Meeting, or AMEM, which has also agreed to strengthen the CCT, including CCUS in the climate change uh, era. Referring to this background, the 19th ASEAN Forum on Coal and the ASEAN Center for Energy plan to organize the webinar on the role of CCT and CCUS in low emission energy development. And today's webinar will be focused on the part of CCUS in the low carbon development in the region. The webinar plans to increase the awareness of CCUS roles in developing the low emission energy development and discuss the opportunity to deploy further the CCUS initiative in the region. Distinguished participants in our webinar today, we will hear from the expert on how to accelerate the CCUS deployment and including the opportunities for CCUS in the region. I hope that today's presentation and discussion will be a solid references and serve as a stepping stone for ASEAN to promote the CCUS development. As for the next step towards our discussion today, ACE will conduct a study on the role of CCUS towards the low carbon economy in ASEAN. The study, which is initiated by the ASEAN Climate Change and Energy Project, or ASEP, will aim to define the low carbon economy and carbon dioxide emission target compared to the six ASEAN energy outlook and provide insights about the role of CCUS in advancing the low carbon economy and provide the recommendation of CCUS deployment in ASEAN. Before I end my remarks, I would like to pay again our highest appreciation to Professor Tutuka Ariaji, the Director General of Oil and Gas, and also Dato Mr. Abdul Rajib Dawood, the Chief Executive Officer for Energy Commission Malaysia, and also ASEAN Forum on Coal, Chairman, I'm looking forward to a more vital collaboration in the future. I wish you all to have a productive and insightful discussion today. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Back to you, KB. Thank you very much, Dr. Nurki, for delivering the first welcoming remark. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Abdul Razib Dawood, the Chief Executive Officer of Energy Commission Malaysia and the Chairman of ASEAN Forum on Coal. Please, Mr. Abdul Razif Daoud, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Master of Ceremony, Ms. Uh, Gabriel, Gabriela uh, Lenanto, for the introduction. Uh, Pak DG uh, Professor IR Tutuka Ariaji. Pak Nuki, uh, Pak Dr. Nuki Agia Utama, Executive Director of ASEAN Center of Energy, uh, distinguished uh, delegates, uh, panelists, and friends. Uh, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum dan uh, salam sejahtera. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, ACE for organizing this uh, webinar. I'm sure that all of us will benefit from the knowledge and um, recommendation uh, to be shared today in this webinar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the looming uh, danger that is being posed by the uh, climate change uh, cannot be denied and its uh, effects uh, can be felt even now through the adverse uh, weather condition uh, throughout the entire globe. Uh, one I might assume that with all the lockdowns that we had in uh, uh, last year, 2020, uh, logically we, sh we should have significant uh, reduction on greenhouse gas emission. But even though the economic activities have slowed down so much since the COVID-19 pandemic uh, began, uh, Greenhouse gas emission only reduced by about 5% of the 51 billion ton. So this is a small decline in GHG emission 
is a proof that we cannot reduce uh, GHG emission uh, simply by uh, uh, producing less electricity. Well, we need new tools to uh, combat or fight uh, climate change. And uh, timely that today, uh, the carbon capture uh, storage is one of the many uh, tools in our disposal. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, car carbon capture and storage is the process of uh, capturing waste uh, CO2, usually from a large uh, point sources, such as uh, coal-fired power plants, uh, transporting it to a storage site and depositing it where it will not enter the atmosphere, normally an underground geological formation. However, the captured CO2 has the potential to be further utilized instead of just being stored underground. But nevertheless, the applications of a CO2 storage technologies or other carbon management strategies that may raise the cost of energy, it is unlikely that they will be introduced uh, without regulatory uh, 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 compliance, collaborations, and corporations, especially within the ASEAN member of states. Another challenge for the implementation of uh, CCUS is determining and communicating the uh, social costs of carbon across various communities and include uh, scientists, engineers, uh, policy makers, and the general public. Uh, therefore, uh, various scientific, economic, and societal aspects need to be addressed to ensure uh, successful de developments and implementation of CCUS uh, technologies. So timely, this uh, webinar is organized as one of the uh, planned activities of OBS number two under action plan 2.3, as mentioned by Dr. Nuki just now, of a clean coal and technology in APAI phase two, 2021 to 2025, with the main objective to advance regional actions to enhance a public awareness and image of uh, carbon as clean coal technologies, CCT. So this public discourse, such as this webinar, is very crucial in uh, promoting CCUS as one of the tools, as I mentioned in the beginning, that can be utilized by this ASEAN member state to transition into low carbon economy. Before I end my speech, I would like to again uh, thank uh, ACE and all the ASEAN member states for the uh, continuous support given to effort, activities and program like today's. I wish everyone a successful webinar and I'm looking forward to learning, sharing, and exchanging ideas from the panelists today. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abdul Razib Dawood, for welcoming us with a wonderful speech. In addition to the two wonderful speeches, welcoming remarks from the two great leaders, we are also very delighted to have Professor Insinyur Tutuka Ariyaji, MSc, PhD, IPU, the Director General of Oil and Gas from the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources of Indonesia joining us today. On behalf of the ASEAN Center for Energy, I would like to thank you, Professor, for taking your time to deliver a keynote speech on in our webinar today. I believe your view would be a great reference for us to further develop CCUS in ASEAN region. Let's give a warm welcome to Professor Tutuka Ariyaji. Please, Professor, the time is yours. Excuse me, Professor, sorry, you're still muted.
Is it okay right now? Yeah. Okay. First of all, I would like to uh, apologize on behalf on behalf of the minister for not attending this webinar, and uh, I will deliver a speech in this special event. The role of CCUS in low carbon development in Asia. Executive Director of ASEAN Center for Energy, Dr. Nuki Akia Utama, CEO of Energy Commission Malaysia and ASEAN Forum on Coal, AFOC Chairman, Mr. Abdul Razid Dawood, distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to convey my greatest appreciation to ASEAN Center for Energy for inviting me to the webinar on the role of CCUS on low carbon development in ASEAN. Through this event, I sincerely hope that we can discuss and share about paving the Indonesia pathway to a low carbon economy through the utilization of CCUS. Next slide, please. Yes. Indonesia has ratified the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, cementing the country's commitment to reduce emission and fight global warming. Indonesia has pledged to cut greenhouse gas emission 29% by year 2030 and up to 41% with the international support, including energy and finance. And the sector committed to reduce greenhouse gas emission by 314 to 398 million tons CO2 equivalent in year 2030 through the development of renewable energy, implementation of energy conservation, as well as the application of clean energy technology. Becoming the core of climate mitigation actions, energy transition towards cleaner and more sustainable energy systems play a key role in reducing carbon emission to achieve net zero emission NZT by year 2016, or even sooner with support from the other countries. Clean technology solutions such as CCUS is the main consideration to ensure availability, affordability, sustainability, and competitiveness to achieve energy sovereignty, as well as climate resilience and low carbon. In the global energy development, CCUS has increasingly become an important discussion to reduce the emission and we use it to enhancing oil recovery in the depleted oil fields. Indonesia has multiple industrial CO2 sources, such as coal-fired power plants, natural gas processing, or refineries, and diverse chemical plants. We have been developing some policies to support CCUS implementation, such as Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources Decree, number 22, year 2019, on emission, inventory, and mitigation on energy sector. Establish a CCS, CCUS National Center of Excellence in year 2070 with a university and research center, that is ITV and Lumigas, strengthening bilateral and multilateral cooperation on CCS and CCUS, and drafting detailed policy on CCS, CCUS, as well as promoting carbon trading. The early stages of CCUS development in Indonesia was started by utilizing the existing CO2 emitted by gas processing plant for CO2 enhanced oil recovery, EOR, in oil fields, which are close to the plant. Success of the use of CO2 for EOR, as CCUS will support the utilization of fossil energy in sustainable low carbon activities, which also include the use of coal power plant. Based on a study conducted by Lomigas, 
in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, Indonesia has a significant storage potential, which is around 1.5 gigatons of CO2 spread over several areas, especially in Sumatra, Java, and Kalimantan, Papua, and Papua. Currently, these are several studies being conducted, such as in Gude, Sukawati, and Tango, with total CO2 stored potential around 48 million ton CO2. Meanwhile, the potential of CCS US implementation in coal fight and coal fight power plants and combined cycle power plants cover three main islands in Java, Sumatra, and Kalimantan, with total capacity around 38 gigawatts and 180 million ton CO2. I think potential for climate mitigation and improving productivity, there are several issues related to CCUS deployment in Indonesia. It includes a relatively high cost energy, monitoring obligation on the production sharing contract requirement, cooperation scheme with third party funding, the potential of carbon credit trading, and a regulatory framework harmonization. Several points that need to be addressed in developing CCUS are number one, improving the economic efficiency of CCUS business. It is necessary to reduce expenses involving CCUS as much as possible through technology development and systematic optimization. Two, calculation of CO2 reduction or storage and international harmonization. It is important to establish a mechanism for evaluating the CO2 reduction storage achieved through CCUS and to internationally harmonize the evaluation method. Number three, long-term stability of CO2 storage. It is necessary to verify long-term stability and improve the reliability. I repeat, it is necessary to verify long-term stability and improve reliability by evaluating the long-term ability of the geographic stratum to store CO2. Improving the technology for practicing long-term CO2 behavior and establishing an appropriate monitoring method. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, implementing decarbonization through CCUS have many challenges. Therefore, with mutual collaboration, I believe we can deploy this clean technology. We are looking forward to collaborating with all parties, mainly private sectors, to utilize CCUS as part of energy transition business opportunities in Indonesia. Thank you. Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources, Arifin Tasek. Thank you very much, Professor Tutuka Ariyaji, on behalf of the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources of Indonesia for delivering such a great speech. Before we move on to the next session, I would like to invite all speakers to turn on your cameras to take a picture together. My colleague, Mr. Suwanto, will assist us in taking the photo. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. One, two, and three. Okay. One more. One, two, and three. Okay. Thank you. Allow me to leave this webinar. Okay. So just, uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, much uh, Mr. Suwanto. And now moving on to the next agenda, I would like to invite Mr. Benny Suryadi, who will be moderating today's webinar. Mr. Benny is currently the manager of Power Fossil Fuel Alternative Energy and Storage Department at the ASEAN Center for Energy. 
He has over 10 years of experience managing research and programs related to energy, power, and climate change in Southeast Asia, supporting the countries in accelerating their energy transition. Mr. Benny also managed two ASEAN major projects, the ASEAN Climate Change and Energy Project, or ACCEPT, which is the first integrated energy and climate change project in ASEAN, and the ASEAN Interconnection Master Plan Study, or AIMS-3, which is a regional blueprint for electricity interconnection in the region. Previously, he was the team leader on the development of the ASEAN Energy Outlook. Now, I would like to turn over the microphone to Mr. Benny. Please, Mr. Benny, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Gabriela Iannanto. Um, I assuming everyone can see my video and also uh, uh, my audio is clear. Uh, good afternoon, everyone from uh, Jakarta. And as introduced, uh, I am Benny Suryadi from the Power Fossil Fuels Alternative Energy and Storage uh, Department of the ASEAN Center for Energy. And um, uh, this afternoon, I have a privilege to moderate uh, this as our uh, distinguished um, uh, leaders mentioned in the beginning, the very critical topics uh, for the regions uh, today on the role of the CCUS in the low carbon development in ASEAN. Um, I have uh, four plus one um, um, experts joining with us um, in this uh, discussion. Um, we will go one by one uh, to listen uh, from them, uh, but in general, that we have uh, Mr. Juho Lipponen from the Clean Energy Ministerial and Adam uh, from the International Energy Agency. We have also Pa Efi Hayadi from the PLN and Marietta from the Department of Energy and uh, Philippines. Um, uh, for the first, first round of uh, panel discussion, I would like to invite um, each of our panel to uh, share their work um, and their views about uh, CC uh, US. Uh, we will give them uh, five minutes uh, uh, time to uh, fully introduce them and introduce their institution. And for that, allow me to start with uh, Mr. Juho Liponen. Um, um, he has a very long uh, 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 experience on the CCUS, uh, but the short bio that I can share is uh, Juho is the coordinator of the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS initiative. So this is one of among several initiatives under the Clean Energy Ministerials. Um, Juho worked closely with the co-chair and all 12 initiative members and uh, also uh, responsible for a day-to-day -day running of the uh, activities of this initiative. And he's the correct person to talk today because prior to this as well, between 2010-2018, Juho was the head of the Carbon Capture and Storage Unit at the International Energy Agency and also acting uh, head of the Energy Technology Policy uh, Division. Um, currently, as I am based in uh, Paris, uh, France. So, um, Mr. Juho, that um, I'd like to invite you uh, to share your work um, for five, uh, five to seven, seven minutes, please. Very good. Uh, thank you, Benny. Also, checking if you can give me thumbs up that my voice is is audible and uh, and and you can see me yeah great um yeah so uh, benny thank you very much for uh, uh for the uh, introduction and uh, all the folks at the asean center for energy uh, uh thank you very much for the invitation uh great to great to be in the panel with you and and to collaborate um yet yeah, everybody who is listening uh thanks so much for your time and for your interest in carbon capture, and hopefully we can bring you some interesting insights into, into CCS, CCUS, uh, where it is and, and how we can move faster ahead. Um, uh, next slide, please, if you, um, you can move one ahead. Um, so I work with the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS initiative, and just briefly, the C uh, Clean Energy Ministerial, or the SEM, is a global process to accelerate clean energy. Uh, the green countries in that map uh, are the SEM members, uh, 
so it covers really um, the whole, uh, you know, every every continent. Uh, and there's also some countries that are marked in blue who are not full members, but who have been involved in in the set. So it is a very uh, relevant uh, set of countries. 90% of clean energy investments happen in these countries. Uh, next slide, please. The SEM has various uh, work streams. One of them is uh, the CCUS initiative. You see the, the 12 country members uh, and their flags on the left-hand side of the uh, slide here. Um, so this is a, a subset of the SEM members, uh, 12 countries who are uh, many of them very much in the lead uh, in uh, CCUS development. Uh, others somewhat perhaps more followers, but uh, nevertheless, countries that regard this as being strategically important for them. And, and so um, together, we, we, we work together to accelerate uh, CCUS. Uh, we also, in, in, we have basic country membership, but also lots of collaboration with industry and finance sector organizations. Uh, next slide, please. So here, just a few uh, thoughts, uh, sort of more strategically and, and big picture on on CCUS, if we if we start from the bottom left hand side, uh, resetting strategic narrative. I think we have in the past years really seen that CCUS is seen as an opportunity, uh, is seen as something that really can uh, can help us drive uh, low carbon development in many countries, and um, and this is a very very positive. I think the strategic narrative around carbon capture has really uh, changed a lot and it has moved ahead and is more realistic now. Uh, and, uh, and aspects such as the role of CCUS in decarbonizing hard to abate industry sectors uh, is really something that is, is more and more uh, important and regarded more and more by uh, lots of countries. But there's also moving to the top left corner, uh, a lot of emerging policy and ambitions that countries have, uh, have put in place. Just listing the countries who are members in our initiative, um, uh, virtually everybody now has mid-century net zero uh, emission goals. Uh, and that is, is, a, is a great driver for carbon capture technology. Uh, and those mid-century net zero goals, just a couple of years ago, they didn't really exist. And now, now they are really mainstream. So that is a, that is a, a great backdrop. Uh, in addition to that, many of the countries uh, have a lot of CCUS specific policy that has been put in place or is being put in place. So there's, there's excellent drivers uh, out there at the moment to, to, to move ahead and interesting examples to, uh, to share. And we'll probably come back to some of these uh, uh, during the discussion. Um, top right hand corner, then uh, we have also a, a project development that has been speeding up in the, in the recent years. There's uh, 20 odd projects operating at the moment, but uh, several dozen others that are in the drawing boards. And, and so the, the curve of, uh, of new projects that we see uh, is really also going upwards, which is, which is an excellent, excellent trend. And CCUS as a business offering is being, is being seen by many companies, uh, many technology providers. And that's, that's really, really excellent. Um, but then going back down to the um, uh, bottom right hand side, the collaboration really remains critical. Investing in CCUS is a, is a three legged stool. It requires governments, it requires industry, and it requires the finance sector uh, to come together. And they all have their, all, their, their role to, to, to play here. And then back to the very uh, title of this slide. There is lots of positive energy around CCUS at the moment, but this wheel really needs to be kept uh, kept turning, and I think that's the that's the challenge. The picture is is good, but uh, we must not forget that really it requires a lot of work to to keep the wheel turning. If we go to the next slide, please, and that's the that's the final one. So the CCUS initiative, uh, just a couple of thoughts on what we do and how we how we can be a platform to accelerate CCUS. Um, first of all, it is important to ensure that CCU is actively included in global clean energy discussions. And that's something that we try to ensure with our initiative uh, and each time uh, get CCUS firmly on the 
clean energy ministerial agenda at any other uh, relevant process as well. And back in, uh, in, in early June at the 12th clean energy ministerial, uh, CCUS was actually mentioned by several ministers and delegations in those discussions. So I think that was, that was uh, really positive. Uh, secondly, uh, we think it is really important to bring together governments, private sector, investment community uh, to, to uh, work together on, uh, on projects and to share experience uh, and share knowledge. And that's also one of the functions that, that we, try to, we try to serve. Uh, thirdly, um, it's also important to start and, and continue to identify near-term and long-term investment opportunities. And that's another uh, uh, area of our work that we have been doing together with industry and the finance sector, bringing people together in, in, uh, uh, in conventions meetings to really discuss where strategic CCUS hubs and investment opportunities might, uh, might exist. And fourthly, last but not least, it's really useful and important today to disseminate best practice and to, to uh, disseminate the good uh, examples and experience that countries have. And that's another function that our initiative is, is doing, not only with our members, but also towards the, uh, uh, to, towards the wider public. And next slide, please. I believe uh, that's just uh, some, some information of our uh, presence uh, in, in various parts of the, of the internet. So please get in touch when uh, uh, and if you if you want to, I'll finish here and back to you, Benny. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh for sharing with us on what the uh, uh, Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS uh, initiative is doing. And uh, congratulations for the latest uh, ministerial meeting in Chile. I, I I learned about that, and I think it's it's quite a, a significant success in pushing this clean energy agenda. And I um, congratulate as well uh, because uh, you also the man who's running this show. Um, uh, moving moving away from the global initiative, then we 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 want to talk about what happened at. Um, in, in, in uh, Southeast Asia. So allow me to go with our second uh, speaker, um, Adam Palin Stern um, from the International and Energy Agency. Um, uh, Adam is an uh, energy analyst with the uh, CCUS unit at the IEA. Um, previously, he worked as a policy advisor to Canada, Canada's Minister of Environment and the climate change, uh, contributing to the development and implementation of the climate, uh, a kind of climate change and clean growth plan, and had also uh, had role at several leading Canadian energy and economic research organization. Uh, before you, you move, we start with the presentation, Adam, then the congratulations as well for your team at IEA is releasing this uh, CCUS uh, report. I think it's, it's also, um, become a reference uh, by uh, many of us in this region. So I uh, pass to you, uh, Adam, for your five minutes uh, around to, to talk about uh, uh, your work on this uh, CCUS. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Benny. And uh, just to confirm, um, hear me well on my, my screen. Uh, is yes. Visible? Yeah. Yeah. OK, great. So. Um, yeah, so th thank you again. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here today to have the opportunity to, to be a part of this event um, and alongside the, the other great panelists uh, and speakers that, that were before me and, and that are still to come. Uh, and thanks, of course, um, very much to the, to the ASEAN Center for Energy for, for inviting me to be here today and, and for your excellent uh, support and coordination. Um, so as Benny mentioned today, um, most of what I'll be discussing today um, is, is drawing on, on a report that we released at the IEA on opportunities for CCUS in Southeast Asia. Um, this came out in June. Um, so just a little background before I get into my slides. Um, at the IEA, um, in my role on the CCUS team here, um, we've been focused on, on the transition to net zero emissions. Um, we look at all fuels and all technologies and um, in our long-term scenario analysis, 
uh, we include hundreds of clean technology options. Um, we recognize that a wide portfolio is needed to get to net zero. Um, also from our analysis, uh, it's clear that CCUS technologies are going to play a critical and, and diverse role in meeting our energy and climate goals and, and that it will be virtually impossible to get to net zero without CCUS. Um, this is because of, of the, the significant strategic value that it can offer. Um, for example, um, hydrogen production, industry, um, even removing CO2 from the atmosphere through technologies um, like direct air capture. So um, in terms of kind of uh, a bit of context uh, on the, the energy um, trends in Southeast Asia region. Um, so here looking at 2015 to 2019, um, we see how Southeast Asia is really one of the fastest growing regions in the world um, from an energy perspective. Um, second only uh, over this period to the People's Republic of China. Um, the energy growth has been heavily reliant on fossil fuels with around 90% uh, since 2000 having been fueled by, by coal, gas, or oil. Um, and this has led to, to um, growth in emissions. Um, looking at some of our, our long-term scenario analysis, um, in this case, looking at our sustainable development scenario, oops, um, our sustainable development scenario, um we, we it, the analysis really underscores how how critical of a role ccus technologies play um and really how they play a role in in almost all parts of the energy system uh, so as shown in the slide here um co2 capture could reach uh, would reach at least 35 megatons of co2 per year um in a decade from now in, in around 2030 um, so this is actually roughly uh, equal to the level uh, of capture globally today. The initial opportunities represented here include, for example, some early and lower cost retrofit opportunities that are in industry. Uh, and by 2050, this grows to over 200 megatons uh, annually with, with CCUS deployed at scale and across uh, power industry and fuel transformation sectors. Achieving this level of CCUS deployment uh, in the region does require considerable investment. Um, and as shown in the current slide, uh, this, this grows to an average of, of almost uh, 1 billion US dollars per year um, by the end of this decade. Um, while this CCUS investment from our projections is actually less than 1% of Southeast Asia's total energy related investment needs, um, which are on the order of 140 billion, um, it's nonetheless um, an investment of a considerable magnitude, um, something that will will need support uh, from international mechanisms um, that requires considerable private sector investment, um, and also that um, calls for an increased availability of debt finance to help um, help provide project funding. Looking um, a little bit more at some of the, the kind of specific CCUS opportunities, um, in this, this next slide, we're looking at um, the idea of locked in infrastructure. So um, where are some of the key opportunities in Southeast Asia? One of them is, is to retrofit the region's existing energy infrastructure, um, which is still relatively new. Nearly half of the, the region's fossil-based power plant fleet um, have been built from our analysis over the last decade. Um, and we found that over 20 gigawatts of additional capacity um, is under construction still in the region. Um, similar story for industrial facilities, for example, that manufacture steel or cement. Um, and the analysis finds that uh, if these were to operate to the end of their technical lives, so 30, 40 years, uh, emissions could amount to over 33 gigatons of CO2 over the next 50 years. Um, this is really equivalent to, to all energy sector, uh, sector emissions worldwide in 2019. So absent measures such as CCUS retrofitting, um, this would be possible. Uh, the next slide um, is drawn, of course, uh, from, from our recently report, uh, released report, where we looked at um, several different countries in the Southeast Asia region um, by different um, opportunity factors, as we call them here. So this is really looking at different kind of um, 
policy, industrial, geological factors, um, and really highlights how, uh, how it varies among countries. Um, and how, for example, while several countries have, many countries actually have, have considerable CO2 storage or enhanced oil recovery potential, um, only a few of them offer supportive policy environments. So it gives a picture of where, where the opportunities lie and, and what gaps need to be filled, for example, uh, in order to, to advance CCUS deployment. So one more uh, slide here before I, I get to some concluding messages. Um, here, um, showing some of the, the really interesting mapping, uh, I think, that we've done as part of this report. Uh, so um, what we were trying to, to highlight with this mapping is that targeting industrial clusters um, where, where there are uh, CO2 emissions from, from industry from power that are located um, close to each other can help to support economies of scale, scale and, and to kickstart deployment of CCUS in the region. Uh, and this is because uh, what we call we can call a hub approach um, can enable CO2 capture from multiple facilities, um, which would then share infrastructure that takes captured CO2 um, and transports it um, and uh, to a site of storage. So this shared kind of transport and storage infrastructure can really increase the efficiencies um, given, for example, um, the high capital costs that can be involved with, with this infrastructure development. And this mapping really helped to answer this question of where could this happen? Where are these um, uh, major emissions clusters that happen to be located near uh, suitable on or offshore geological storage? Um, so I would encourage anyone who's interested um, to look for this report on the, the IEA's website. Um, it is an interactive map that allows you to zoom in and out uh, to see more detail on a particular part of the region, um, to look by sector um, or highlight uh, existing or, or planned CCUS projects. So uh, to conclude, um, we, we came up with four high level uh, priorities for governments and industry that could accelerate uh, progress of CCUS in the region over the next decade. And, and as you'll see on the screen, these pertain to developing CO2 storage resources, um, ensuring um, that legal and regulatory frameworks are in place, um, implementing policies that really are targeted towards CCUS, and finally, accessing international finance where needed to build capacity uh, and encourage investment. So uh, thank you very much uh, again uh, for, for having me and looking forward to the questions. Oh, thank you very much. Uh... And um, that's uh, for sharing with us the finding uh, from the latest reports of IEA on the CGUS uh, for this region. I mean, as I can see in the Q&A, uh, there's a lot of questions uh, addressing on this kind of topic. Uh, it will be a very interesting uh, discussion later, uh, but we need to wait a while because um, after talking about region, now let's move to the national levels. Um, so we will hear uh, 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 from the next uh, speakers, uh, from Bapak Evi Haryadi, um, the Director of uh, Corporate Planning at the uh, PLN. Uh, since uh, last month, so congratulations as well, Pak, uh, for this uh, promotion. Uh, before that, uh, he was uh, the Head of Center of the Excellence um, in January this year. But also before that, uh, Evi Haryadi was a general manager of the uh, PLN. And also, um, it's one good, I mean, I'm happy to share that but I already was a brand manager in my hometown uh, 20 years ago. So it's a very good to be connected again. Uh, but, and so move with your uh, five minutes as well but to also share with us about uh, the war in PLN and the strategy and readiness in entering the energy transition era with uh, CCUS. So um, I uh, pass the screen to you, uh, please. Okay, thank you, uh, moderator, for uh, the introduction. Uh, I would like to share our presentation. Uh, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, 
everybody is in uh, the, the slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a bit of honor for me to deliver a presentation in the webinar on the role of uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage in low carbon development in Asia. In this opportunity, I would like to present the PLN strategy and readiness in entering energy transition. Uh, there is the uh, three outline here. First is uh, energy transition strategy, PLN carbon neutral 2060. Uh, second is readiness and challenge in the CCUS utilization and a recommendation for future CCUS uh, utilization. For the first agenda, uh, I would like to uh, talk about energy transition strategy of LN Carbon Neutral 2060. Here we see the Indonesian energy transition uh, history here. In the slide, uh, we saw that in 1990, PLN has uh, start the electricity generation which dominated by uh, oil to reduce uh, the electricity production. Uh, but uh, in uh, 20, 1965, uh, PLN is begin uh, the energy transition to coal by developing a uh, Suralaya for a time for 100 megawatt and also uh, Python to time uh, 400 uh, megawatt. We start in 1993 uh, here, the PLN uh, start to transition to gas, uh, to build the gas fire oil plant, to reduce the oil also the consumption. But in 2021, there is a lack of uh, and shortage of gas supply of the power plant. And uh, because of that, since 2060, we moved to the coal uh, to total zero and uh, starting the fast track program. And uh, we call it, uh, 10 gigawatt uh, fast track. And then uh, the last, we also doing the transition to renewables in the fast track program to start from 2014. Unfortunately, the implementation of renewable energy in this uh, state is not going well. This most the project was uh, delayed uh, up to 2025. The first project uh, has been uh, finished since 2014, and uh, until 2021, there is about uh, one gigawatt of the geothermal and hydro power plant operation. This, uh, the fourth transition to renewables based on uh, hydro power plant and geothermal power plant. And then Valen is among the first uh, six Asian electricity players to commit to a net zero aspiration. Uh, the PLN decarbonization commitments, uh, there is uh, uh, four uh, points. One is achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. We also uh, deal that no new coal plant awarded after 2020. And uh, we also uh, try to achieve 20% uh, renewables mixed by 2025. Related to uh, zero, uh, carbon neutral in 2060, we will exit from coal fire power plant by 2050, uh, 56. Here we see the alternative technology progression uh, yeah, that could have implication in the potential uh, net zero pathways. There is a uh, uh, three technology progression in the, in, in the current progression is a business as usual. We try to deploy coal and gas and also low cost uh, renewables. With this, uh, initiative, uh, we can make uh, ensure the security of supply is achieved. But uh, still, there is a problem in environmentally uh, and also uh, some equation in affordability of the tariff. Based on this, we will uh, try to make uh, the scenario. One scenario is uh, accelerated uh, progression that using renewables with deploying uh, geothermal and geothermal and also hybrid renewables, it will uh, have a good environmental impact. And uh, but there is uh, some question also in in the cost of the affordable the affordability, and also some question and security of supply because in the, in here the renewables that will be implemented is related with the intermittent uh, technology like a solar PV or the wind turbine. Another scenario is we call it the disrupted progression. It's a 
technology that deploy the CCUS, the hydrogen infrastructures, also for reducing emission uh, from existing coal and also gas uh, power system. In this initiative, this will be good in environment and uh, also in security of supply because it's, uh, it's a base load uh, power plant for us. Uh, it's very convenient for us for security of supply, but there is a big uh, question mark in uh, affordability. This is uh, our uh, plan or our vision about uh, 2060 demand uh, forecast. There is a huge uh, opportunity for uh, renewables uh, if we see the, the demand forecast in the future. Uh, mostly the growth is around uh, 300 uh, terawatt hours uh, years. We have a two scenario uh, how we will achieve the carbon neutral 2060. One scenario is based on coal fire for plant that we fired uh, based on uh, this graph. First, we start. Uh, we will uh, if we just if we see from 2019 2028 uh, RUPTL, all the RUPTL using. Uh, coal and gas in 2025 uh, development plan. We try we try to replacement all of this uh, planning of new coal and gas, but and changing uh, with the ABT base, base load we call it. But it's still uh, thinking that there is a new technology that innovate in this uh, area, and we can change. Uh, the base loaders, renewables that been uh, using coal and gas to the renewables, and then start from 2030, we will retire our subcritical uh, coal power plant is around one gigawatt, and then nine gigawatt uh, this phase two of the subcritical in uh, 2035, and then 2030. 40 start the retirement of supercritical around uh, 10 gigawatts. And then the supercritical all power plant starting uh, retire in 2045 till 2056. Uh, because in 2056, all of uh, our supercritical is, has been uh, finished of uh, our PPA there. And, uh, uh, we will uh, could retire in that time. This is the first scenario. Another scenario that we think there is, uh, this is the scenario one still, uh, how uh, the impact of the initiative to, with the coal power, coal uh, fuel mix. If we see here, the coal consumption will be increased just only till 2030 because we, we still have a 30, 35 gigawatt uh, program that has been developing until now and will be finished is around 2026. And based on that, uh, still there is uh, some uh, increasing the coal till 2030 and then start uh, reducing from that time till 2056 here. Yeah. If related to the coal uh, fuel mix, uh, the coal fuel mix is uh, shown here. We start from 30 eggs and will be finished uh, mostly in uh, 2050, it's around just only for uh, 7%. There. This is the scenario number two that we are thinking. In scenario number two, we have uh, uh, innovation in a CCUS technology and also the, the cost. The more uh, uh, efficient and the more uh, cheap, uh, the cheaper technology of the CCUS will be achieved around 2035. This is our vision. If this has been uh, implemented at that time, we try to implement this technology start from 2035. Between 2021 till 2030, the same in the same initiative and the same uh, program with the scenario one. But start from 
2035 we are using the CCOS and also this can be reducing the nuclear power plant that operate uh, 2040. The same uh, nuclear power plant is also operated in the scenario one, but it is more bigger than uh, the, 20, the scenario two. If we, can, if we compare about the fuel mix and also the uh, utilization of uh, coal for coal, in here we see uh, start from 2035, uh, the color from black is become red here. It means uh, this is the coal for the plant that using the CCUS. The quantity is around uh, 150 uh, terawatt hours here. It means it's around 40 to 45 uh, gigawatt uh, of the power because it's, there is uh, some reducing in uh, efficiency if you are using a CCUS. And then uh, if we see from a pure mix point of view, the pure mix is uh, become like a discrete. How uh, the readiness and challenge in the CCUS utilization? Uh, PLN uh, has conducted several studies on CCUS uh, utilization. First is a uh, study of carbon capture storage CCS uh, has been uh, do uh, together with the World Bank in 2005. We also doing technological and financial study on the application of carbon capture in power plant. We have uh, PLN Research Institute. They are doing also uh, this uh, research. Uh, until now, they are also do is, uh, doing this research. Another is technical and financial readiness. Uh, we see that CCOS uh, related with the technic uh, technically uh, aspect is uh, feasible, but CCS is not economically feasible to be implemented with the current policy. Uh, the abatement cost of CCS is equivalent to about uh, 100 uh, US dollar uh, per ton CO2 emission. Why did if we see if we get this from a PLN World Bank study in 2015, or you around 35 US dollar per ton CO2 if we compare with the global CCUS uh, Institute study. Uh, PLN has increased awareness and capacity uh, building uh, also related here. This now the problem is uh, policy. Uh, without policy support, PLN uh, faces many challenges in implementing uh, CCS. We, we see uh, here there is uh, some issue related to CCS, CCS implementation in PLN. One is reduction of the net dependable capacity. It means uh, there is uh, some correction in efficiency of the power plant. The other is incremental investment for CO2 uh, uh, capture because it's an uh, in investment and also equipment deterioration of plant heat rate because of this uh, reducing the NDC, it means the efficiency will be reduced and also the plant heat rate will be changed. Another additional land provision, also the preemptive power plant design and limited uh, depleted oil and gas reservoir for CO2 storage. It's, uh, it could be not so close uh, to our power plant. It's make it a higher cost and need uh, some support from the another uh, policy uh, from the government and also from uh, there's a climate plan or uh, another. A recommendation for future CCS implementation. Uh, now, CCS is unique uh, in that CO2 abatement process. This cannot be accomplished in one integrated step alongside for generation. It requires the successful implementation of the three sequential steps, start, starting from the capture of CO2 at the port one level, transportation, then also the storage in the deep underground at the surface level. The CCUS sent involved operators both within the outside the port sector, thus causing some unique institutional challenge. The step of the CCUS require the facilitation of appropriate institutional, legal, regulatory framework to govern the structures, operation, ownership, management, and monitoring of the process, neither of the which is currently in place. Recommendation for the futures uh, is a creating an enabling policy and regal regulatory uh, environment. 
Plus is national climate policy to recognize CCS as means of CO2 emission reduction. Endorsement of the CCS roadmap at the national level. Also concerted effort along the CCS chain, CO2 capture, transportation, and also the storage. We also need a bridging technical and financial viability gap. We must consider adding CCS readiness provision in the BPA, such as space provision and design modification, provide a policy incentive for future uh, CCS implementation, go to initiate CCS pilot and demonstration activity for the four sector, four sector particip participation in the CCS roadmap, additional revenue from enhanced oil recovery and support from climate plan and also the carbon value. That was a plan and strategy, readiness, challenges, and recommendation for future CCS implementation. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'm looking forward for the next discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pa. It's a very um, uh, enlightening information. And I kind of agree more that on your point, there is a need of escorted effort uh, for, from all, everyone, every stakeholder in the CC exchange. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think we also have a lot of questions from our audience um, in the context of Indonesia. But now we move to the Philippines, uh, where we are going to hear also on the uh policy plan opportunity of the ccus in the context of uh, philippines will be uh, delivered by uh, marietta Quejada, uh supervising a uh, research specialist uh, from the energy policy and planning bureau uh, department of energy and philippines um, she leads uh, the policy research and modeling section which produce uh, the energy outlook of uh, the philippines this is a very vital input to the Philippine energy plan. Uh, Marita is also uh, was also a member of the negotiating team of the Philippine for the COP uh, 21 in 2015 and uh, led, conducted, and contributed to the climate change related study for uh, the last uh, 10 years. So, uh, with Marita, if I may pass uh, the screen for you to uh, share from the Philippine perspective. Thank you. Yeah, we can see your screen, uh, but it's you're still muted. Yeah, good yeah. afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you. Can, can you hear me clearly? Yes, very okay. clear. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present the Philippines policy plans and opportunities of uh, carbon capture utilization storage. Um, uh, distinguished guests um, and organizers and all the participants, good afternoon. Okay, um, today I'm going to discuss four items um, the 2020 energy situation, our 2018 to 2040 energy outlook, policies, plans, and programs, and the challenges for carbon capture utilization and storage. Um, in 2020, um, the downtrend of the demand as an impact of the restriction of community quarantines that halted major economic uh, activities caused the total primary energy supply to reduce by 5.8% to 56.4 million tons of oil equivalent from the 2019's 59.9 million tons of equivalent as levels of indigenous and net imported energy registered 40% and 7.8% reduction, respectively. Coal overtook oil, contributing 30.9% against oil's 29.2%. Oil declined by 30.7% uh, to 16.5 million tons of oil equivalent 
due to cuts in domestic production and net importation, albeit coal supply is slightly reduced by 0.8%. Fossil fuels accounted to a total of 65.8%, while renewable energy dropped by uh, 2% to 19.3 uh, 19 million tons of oil equivalent. Uh, this slide shows the total final energy consumption in 2020. Uh, the left figure is about the uh, final consumption by sector. In 2020, the total final energy consumption dropped by 10.7% to 30.4 million tons of oil equivalent from the 36.3 million tons in 2019. The, the decline is brought by the impact of restrictions of economic activities to contain the COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines, which started in March 2020. The right figure, figure refers to the total final energy consumption per fuel. Oil stood at 16 a million tons of oil equivalent or 13.2% uh, lower than the 29th 80. 18.5 million tons of oil equivalent, contributing almost half of the total final energy consumption. Electricity consumption accounted for 22.1%, albeit fell by 4.4% to 7.2 million tons from the 2019 7.5 million tons of oil equivalent. Of these, household uses 40.4% as majority of the workforce shifted to work from home scheme for several months. In this slide, we can see the generation and capacity mix in 2020. In 2020. The 2020 electricity generation is stands at 102 terawatt hour with a total installed capacity of 26 gigawatt. Electricity generation went down by 4% from the 2019 level, and yet we see coal still contributing significantly with more than a half at 57.2% or 58.2 terawatt hour, while renewable energy and natural gas contributed 21% and 10% respectively. Um, this is a glimpse of our energy outlook 2018 to 2040. While we continue to be at par with our ASEAN neighbors, having the highest renewable energy at over 30%, which is also on par with many countries in the developed world, we see that coal will still maintain the 27% in the total primary energy supply under the clean energy scenario. With this, coal contributes one third in power generation and seem to contribute still in the total final energy at 17, at 7% 7 by 2040. Uh, this slide shows the reference scenario vers versus the clean energy scenario. Looking at the power generation mixed for closely, um, um, we see that coal is still the major source contributing 55% and 33% respectively for the reference and the clean energy scenario. Um, this is slide. Uh, um, shows our policies, plans, and programs. Um, the Philippines uh, policies, plans, and programs is geared towards achieving the clean energy scenario for a sustainable development and mitigating the greenhouse gas emission despite having the lowest G GSG emission per capita in the region and we just one over seven of the world's average. Coal still plays a major role in our energy security with the available indigenous reserves 
of about 800 million metric tons. Of this, there is an opportunity to produce 300 million metric tons to augment the energy supply. From the previous slide, the current total installed capacity for coal fired power plants accounts for 42% and more are coming on stream to augment the supply of electricity generation in the coming years. Towards a low carbon future, the Philippines policies, plans, and programs are as follows. For power sector, there is a declaration of coal moratorium because we see the influx of large scale power plants despite the many renewable energy projects, which are far lower in terms of capacity. To ensure the availability of electricity supply, we have the performance audit of the power plants. We also have a greater use of smart grid technology and expand the use of natural gas. To achieve our nat national renewable energy plan, the supporting mechanisms include renewable portfolio standards, green energy auction, and full participation of large scale geothermal development. On the demand side, the one, uh, we have promulgated the energy efficiency and conservation law to implement energy efficiency as a way of life. The government is set as the example with the government energy management program, appliance energy labeling and energy standards. Other programs include exploring alternative fuels and technologies. For carbon capture, utilization, and storage, currently the Philippines has no program on this. We are yet to explore its viability, the required infrastructure, the supporting mechanisms, and challenges on public acceptability. To address the challenges, there is an opportunity for the ASEAN for knowledge and experience sharing on the component of a CCUS system and performance of existing, existing system, and effective laws, policies, regulation, and business models on CCUS is needed. Feasibility studies are needed and identify potential sites for storage. This will provide investment opportunities, but financing is needed for infrastructure for, uh, for infrastructure is also a challenge. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity and for listening. Um, thank you very much, uh, Marietta. And, um, Indonesia and Philippines share a lot of uh, common characteristics. So, um, I see there is a uh, challenge on CCUS is also sharing between Indonesia and the Philippines. Thank you very much for, for, for your presentation. Um, next, uh, we move to the next one. Uh, we will have uh, Beth Falio, uh, Vice President, uh, Strategy and Stakeholders Relation uh, from the International CCS Knowledge Centers. Uh, but, but it's a 2 a.m. in uh, Regina, Canada. So, but uh, Pat is kind enough to share with us uh, the video so that we can uh, learn uh, the experience and lesson learned from the boundary dam, the CCUS uh, projects. Um, so, um, um, so my ask our team to um, to uh, uh, display the video. Because we are waiting the video that um, to short intro as well that uh, as the vice president uh, um, that is also represent the knowledge center upon the global decision maker and financial to accelerate its engagement on an understanding of deployment of carbon capture and storage. So the video is on now, now let's be here. 
Hi, I'm Beth Hardy Valiajo, the Vice President of Strategy and Stakeholder Relations, and I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about our experience and lessons learned from the Boundary Dam Carbon Capture and Storage Facility on a coal power plant right here in Canada. The International CCS Knowledge Centre is a nonprofit organization created and sponsored by BHP and SAS Power. BHP provided $20 million over five years for the Knowledge Center to accelerate the understanding and use of CCS as a means of managing greenhouse gas emissions. The Knowledge Center houses seconded employees from SAS Power who were instrumental in the development and operations of the Boundary Dam CCS facility. Our team actively engages financiers and decision makers around the world to ensure high level information on carbon capture and storage is conveyed with political, economic, and other broad considerations. We also add practical hands-on development experience, technical advice for planning, design, construction, and operation of carbon capture and storage. The Knowledge Center staff are available to provide ex that experience-based guidance for CCS projects, and cooperative approaches to developing CCS are critical at this early stage where competition is less important than accelerated uptake. The Knowledge Center is tasked with sharing those lessons learned from our actual operational hands-on insight. And that practical form of cooperation should be heightened to ensure that potential facilities save time and effort in developing workable CCS projects. Such experience-based decision-making can avoid costly delays or allow projects to proceed. That cooperation should begin at an early stage. And for more information, you can visit our website at www ccsknowledge.com for more information. On this slide, you'll see the Boundary Dam Carbon Capture and Storage Facility and the coal plant it's attached to. There are four stacks that you'll see here. The one furthest to the left is actually Boundary Dam Unit 3. That's the one that has the carbon capture and storage facility attached to it. The carbon capture and storage facility is on the left. It has an absorber tower, a stripper, a compressor that compresses the CO2 into a supercritical like state. And then that CO2 is used for enhanced oil recovery or sold to, uh, sold to an oil company for that, or it's used for permanent sequestration in a storage site about three kilometers away. This is the world's first large scale post combustion carbon capture and storage facility. And it's actually the only one operating on power today. There's been over 4 million tons stored to date, and it has the capacity to capture 1 million tons a year. It captures about 90% of the CO2 from Unit 3's stack. Also important are all the cars that you'll see here. Those are all the jobs that went into building this project. The total investment in the power units retrofit and carbon capture plant was about $1.5 billion Canadian. And in October 2014, that's when the capture plant started operations. It's, like I said, the only fully integrated post combustion carbon, carbon capture facility on a power plant currently operating at this large scale level. It's those engineers that were involved in this project that are now housed at the International CCS Knowledge Center. And we are here to share from the five years of operation at Boundary Dam Unit 3 to save future CCS plants time, money, and significantly reduce risks by preventing and or eliminating unnecessary detours, delays, and miscalculations from the onset. The focus for now for Boundary Dam 3 is on achieving stable operation that will allow staff to focus on improving efficiency and cost effectiveness of the operation. Thousands of visitors have toured Boundary Dam from dozens of different countries. This is not limited to researcher or engineers uh, interested in the technology either. It also includes many cabinet ministers, international diplomats, multilateral development bank representatives, CEOs of major energy companies, and even the president of COP24, Michael Kurtika. We always extend an invitation to visit and tour our facility. You need to have a full chain understanding of CCS in order to understand what you're going to do with the CO2 once you've captured it. That full chain, chain experience for carbon capture and storage is something we're well aware of. So CO2 source can come from practically any industry. Um, after the combustion, you can capture the emission 
um, like coal, which is very hard to capture because there's lots of particulate matter in it. So for the Boundary Dam plant, for instance, it was 1,100 tons per gigawatt hour. So it's very dirty to operate. With the carbon capture and storage facility on the, on the plant, it's actually about 120 to 140 tons per gigawatt hour of greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 in particular. But let's talk about those other particulates. Air quality is also very important to consider. And the Boundary Dam facility actually has to capture 100% of the SO2, which is acid rain, you know, that comes out of that facility before we can even access the CO2. In addition, half of the nitrous oxide is captured and large quantities of particulate matter 2.5 and 10 are also captured. So we capture those other emissions. Also, we transport our CO2 via a pipeline. And so here in Canada, pipelines are very common and transporting that super critical, almost liquid-like state CO2 uh, is very easily transported via that pipeline. We sell it and also use the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, which is permanently sequestered after that process extracts the oil. And we also have other byproducts that are sold, such as fly ash, which is used in cement uh, production to reduce their emissions as well. We also have, as I mentioned, that local storage site for CO2, which is called the Aquastore Project. It is a major international research project that you can find out more information about on our website. Based on that Boundary Dam 3 experience, we actually took those lessons learned and went just 12 kilometers down the road to do a feasibility study on another coal plant. Double the size, the Shand study, as we call it, demonstrates the value of lessons learned. Those key findings from that study show that it in capturing 2 million tons a year and applying lessons learned, the capital cost can be 67% less per ton of CO2 captured. This is a significant step change. We hope to apply these types of lessons learned to other projects globally and through other sources of industry. We're working with Lehigh Hansen in Edmonton a Heidelberg company to capture 780,000 tons of CO2 off a cement plant. We look to have this project happening in the ground by 2025 and capturing by 2026. These are just some of the things that the Knowledge Center can help you with and know that coal and emissions are able to be reduced using the carbon capture and storage technology that is proven. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to contact us. We look forward to working with you in the future. So um, thank you very much, everyone, um, for listening to uh, which is your video. Then, um, yes, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for all of our audience for posting your question in the, uh, in the box. Um, we are trying to responding some of that, um, uh, the panel, Panelists also already respond to some of that, and then we will address some of our uh, uh, top question live um, as well. Uh, but then, um, after listening from all of the uh, panelists and speakers, that we move to the uh, discussion and to, for for, the, for some question that we have, and for this uh, first round of discussion, I think. Um, also responding to the question that's being raised by many, it's a financing issue. It seems like um, main challenge that we're having. I mean, a lot of questions that we see. So um, just starting the discussion, if I, if I can start with um, Juho, um, you, you mentioned in your slide um, that um, this three legs Oh, that's gonna be a, so that's a, that's that's what in your slide. The government, industry, and the finance sector all have their role to play. Um, but in the context of us in the Southeast Asia, that um, industry or finance are normally coming from outside the region. If I may say that that, that way. Um, also relate to the ambition that you also mentioned. It's it's coming from 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 the outside the region. 
And particularly on the financing side, that it's, uh, um, how, how do you see this? Uh, your... Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Benny. And also uh, really interesting to hear these uh, perspectives from, uh, uh, from obviously Adam and the, the, the wider uh, wider picture, but then uh, then Evi and, uh, and and Marietta as well from uh, from the from the region and uh, um, yeah, indeed. I mean, in in my slide and in our group, we then we have currently the countries who've been perhaps taking the first steps in really driving CCUS. And some of them have been doing it for a, for a long time. Um, uh, I think in the in the ASEAN region, of course, one of the things that can be done and that uh, practically is uh, is perhaps to take the example and and um, uh, experience that uh, uh, maybe primarily Indonesia has been has been gathering in the past uh, past years and is doing now with its you know plans uh, discussion of, of policies being put in place uh, investigation of storage uh, and and so forth which were 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 mentioned mentioned in the beginning. Um, uh, of course, also Asian Development Bank is, is another key institution that can offer both technical assistance for countries to, um, uh, to, to plan and, and drive uh, CCUS uh, uh, development. Um, but I would say that the uh, you know, finance sector in general uh, and, and banks that we have been discussing with is very interested and actually keen to invest in Carbon capture projects, provided there is a uh, that, that they are bankable, and in that sense, I think governments in the region uh, uh, really can do a you know part of this this heavy lifting by uh, by making those plans, putting in place um, particular policy to uh, to ensure that that these projects can can you know burn and be be bankable. Uh, but I think is also country specific, and that needs to be needs to be studied by each each government uh, separately from their own perspective. Thank, thank you, Joe. That's going to be um, and just um, is connecting with that. If I can pass it to Adam, you mentioned that um, uh, achieving the ambitious uh, CCUS deployment target in this region, Southeast Asia, will require considerable uh, investment, uh, so growing to an earth rate of almost uh, 1 billion per year for a CO2 capture facility by 2030. So this is a finding from the IA studies. And um, continue from, from the point raised by Juho earlier, then if I may ask into more specific, who will finance this 1 billion uh, per year, uh, uh, Adam? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Benny and, and Yuho. Uh, for sure, a, a very good question. And, um, and uh, of course, also um, a difficult one to answer um, because it's, you know, these are new, new topics. These are uh, multiple, multiple ways of, of going about them and not all of them have been, have been tested yet in the real world. So, um, uh, so indeed, um, indeed, uh, our projections, our analysis has shown that there is this considerable level of investment that's needed um, in order to support the level of CCUS deployment um, that, that we see. And of course, this investment can't fall on um, governments of the region alone. Um, there, there's got to be a role um, in many of the cases for international public finance institutions. Um, uh, and those institutions themselves need to be given given a strong mandate to, to finance the transitions, um, including for for technologies like CCUS. Um, so, what, one thing that that we see when we we try to look at what are the different types of mechanisms, instruments, um, and funding sources available is that um, there, there's no shortage of money. There's a lot of money that's available um, and intended to be used for for these types of um, technologies, um, but it's not necessarily finding its way to the countries and sectors and, and projects where it's needed most. So, um, for example, for some emerging and developing economies, um, uh, which currently account for, for two thirds of the world's population, um, only one 
fifth of, of global investment in, in clean energy is taking place. So there's a big role for instruments um, in line with, with, with what um, you've all mentioned. So ADB, a key institution, um, which has a CCUS uh, trust fund um, that can be very useful to support kind of capacity building and, and some of the early, um, early, um, early capacity building efforts. Um, but then, then also there, there, are, there are instruments, you know, voluntary, um, voluntary carbon markets um, mechanisms under the UNFCC um, that have been developed or, or are being refined um, currently that, that need to uh, play a role in this, although have yet to be tested in practice. Uh, and then I guess the last point is, is also that sustainable, sustainable debt could also play um, an important role uh, to unlock CCUS investment uh, to complement government's policies. So this could take the form of, of bonds, for example, that are aimed at, at climate-focused uh, investments. Um, so I hope that, that that covers some of um, uh, some of the question. Great. Th thank you, Adam. Then uh, uh, if I can bring Paifi and Marietta as well on this question, um, considering that. Um, Indonesia PLN is a state on companies um, um, and the Philippine um, and it's a liberalized market of electricity. So two excellent examples, I think, uh, for our discussion um, on the question that if PLN or Indonesia is adopting CCUS, who do you think should cover the cost? Uh, Maybe I start with PIV first. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Benny, for the questions. Uh, as you know that uh, PLN is a regulated uh, utility company until now. Uh, there is a regulation that uh, how we will uh, do some uh, cost uh, transfer from a PLN to uh, the government policy. PLN have a task, a second task, uh, there is a two tasks of PLN. One task is the, as a government agent. This means uh, there is uh, some uh, assignment from government for uh, doing uh, rural electricity or another uh, jobs. Another is uh, business uh, task. Related to the business task, uh, everything is must be a corporate action. But if related to uh, this uh, government task, it means related will be transferred to, to subsidize and also the compensation. If we uh, do the CCUS implementing uh, technology in the system, this must be there is uh, some view whether this is uh, the government's uh, task or this uh, corporate action. If, if this related the corporate action, it means uh, it must be. Uh, calculate uh, by uh, the cost and benefit analysis. It means if uh, there is uh, some cost, we must uh, thinking about the revenue from uh, to that. If the cost is uh, bigger than the revenue, maybe uh, it will not uh, be uh, implement uh, decision in our system. But it, if this is uh, the government task, it means there is assignment from the government. It will be transport to the subsidy and the compensation from the government. That's the, the existing regulation until now. It's not the, the new regulation. If, if we want to make uh, some incentive to implement this issue as in the system, maybe some uh, incentive in financing or maybe some incentive uh, uh, from uh, uh, another uh, point of view. Let's say uh, there is uh, some uh, climate fund or something uh, for that. This is uh, that that we need if we want to implement the CCUS in uh, our system now, because uh, there is a dilemma in the system. It's an environmentally uh, aspect, it's a security aspect, and also the affordability aspect. It related the. Environmentally aspect, uh, the CCUS is a good because it's uh, reducing around 90% of the CO2. 
and uh, if related the security is also good because it's not have uh, intermittency uh, like uh, solar wb or the wind turbine but the problem is affordability we'll pay this if uh, the cost is uh, cheap uh, this will be okay for us uh, if we if we see from the business point of view otherwise uh, we need uh, some assignment from the government and it needs subsidy also and the compensation for that that's uh, our answer thank you thank you thank you very much uh, um that's the indonesian context where a regulated market that's going to be a can i pass now to a marietta about um philippine has a different market with indonesia but so um same question perhaps it could be if if the philippine is adopting this in your futures i understand you said before that some um, current policy is not considered uh, a ccus yet but if if philippine is adopting it uh, but philippine exploring this if viable or not right but so who you should who do you think that should cover the costs uh, yeah uh thank you for the question um, currently, our power sector is liberalized. Uh, it's all the it's all the burden is always with is all with the private sectors. But what the government does is uh, to provide policy support when uh, if we will adopt this CCUS, uh, the the government can provide policy support. Uh, can provide uh, fiscal incentives like uh, tax holidays. Uh, same thing that we have done with the renewable energy. When we were first implementing with the renewable energy, we provided all, the government has provided all the policy support that is needed to push for the implementation of renewable energy targets. But this, ca this can be done also for uh, CCUS should we adopt the system. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I've heard from Mr. Hariade also that it can it is possible that uh, the government can provide a fiscal uh, incentives in terms of financing, uh, maybe on the, uh, foreign, uh, what's this? Yeah, in terms of financing, like, uh, um, pro uh, help them with uh, the investor or uh, uh, so that uh, the, the interest will be lower, uh, unlike, unlike what uh, other banks has. But uh, with the government, it could be lower. That's what we can do just to provide a fiscal incentives for, for them, just like what we, ha we have done with other low carbon technologies that we have now, especially for RE. And uh, for RE, RE, as I have presented a while ago, there has been a lot of policy support for, for our RE. That's why um, the solar and wind has been uh, as rich, uh, even uh, more than 500 megawatt now in the Philippines. When we first started that, it's only one megawatt in 2015. But now we, we have more than uh, 500 megawatt installed capacity. Uh, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for sharing as well for the Philippine perspective. Um, I Allow me to hey. take a question. Um, yes, you have. Yeah, may, may I come in very briefly on the finance sector? Sure, one, sure. one sure. more more point. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's um, uh, probably likely to be very case by case in the beginning. Like you know, if you if you if you kind of wonder and if you ask who should finance CCUS, well, it's probably going to be a thing a tough thing to answer in a very holistically at at the start. Yeah. So uh, if you have a you know if let's say a company like PLN who wants to uh, do a project, I would think that the, the, uh, the financing is going to have to come as a, as a package, exactly as was mentioned, some part of it being a, a, a you know, government incentive perhaps, could be a government grant or fund. There could be a second aspect or second part of it, which could be some sort of mandate to actually pass some of the cost to, to customers through a levy or something. Uh, which could be levied to all all customers, 
And if it's only one plant, and if it's only part of one plant, it might be something that is, you know, affordable. Yeah. yeah. And then a third point, uh, clearly, as was mentioned also by by Adam, um, uh, international finance institutions like like ADB, uh, they can finance and they can give uh, they can give loans or even I, I I don't know if they can give grants, but they can certainly be part of uh, of you know financing. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, a large project like like this, but they have to be asked. They have to be be given strong, uh, you know, incentive yeah. and strong signal that we actually, as a government, would like you to work with us on this. And if okay. if, if they're not asked, they won't do anything. Okay, so, thank you very much for pointing that, uh, Joho. So um, we have. Around 10 minutes and I allow me to take the question from our audience. We have a top question coming from um, Jonathan Chu. Uh, and perhaps I will invite uh, Adam and Effie to share perspective on that. Uh, the question is, with the power plant, uh, coal or other fossil fuel coupled with the CCUS, has the government considered incentive or support? considering that most of the power plant has a long-term fixed PPA, or will there be any plans or action considered to tackle such challenge? Um, it's also mentioned it will be a challenge for a power plant operating operators, considering the cost involved in, is significant and it's uh, into the revenue from PPA. Um, but if you mentioned it, a bit before, maybe if you have additional point to respond uh, on this, but uh, let me start with Pai Vivers. Yeah, if, uh, thank you very much for the question. If this uh, related to the PPA, now uh, mostly our coal power plant, especially the independent power producer, uh, using PPA for the transaction for to us. Yeah. This PPA based uh, mostly in for uh, aspect of uh, cost. One is uh, A, component A is uh, for investment point of view. And uh, also we have uh, B uh, and D is related with the uh, operation and maintenance uh, cost. And then a C for the fuel cost. Uh, mostly this is uh, PPA. Uh, creating first based on uh, negotiation and also the tendering process. Uh, if related uh, the new power plants, I think it's possible. We are uh, discussing the PPA uh, for calculating uh, the impact of the technology like a CCUS in the system. But if in the middle of a contract, let's say if we have uh, some uh, contract for 30 years, and in the in the middle of the this uh, contract to our time, uh, there is new technology that we implement in this uh, uh, contract. It must be there is uh, some uh, talk and some negotiation with us uh, how we will. Uh, Manage this kind of uh, 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 what arrangement yeah, for uh, the PPA. It must be there is uh, some incentive maybe for uh, this uh, from the government to, to do because uh, from our point of view that I said before, it must be there is a uh, two aspect that we must uh, have a point of view. Is it a business case or this is the assignment? If it's a business case, this must be, we will uh, thinking about uh, how uh, we must uh, approve uh, the uh, amendment of the PPA because of there is new technology comes uh, in this uh, power plant. If we compare, there is another technology or another uh, solution for the system. Let's say if there is a, another PPA or another uh, independent power producer using like uh, 
battery storage or something. And uh, this also uh, have a good, uh, or <coughs> good opportunity to implement with uh, cheaper uh, PPA. This will be a more uh, attractive for us. That's the problem for the PPA. Mm -hmm. if, if it's in the middle of the contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If yeah. it's a new one, yeah. uh, it's okay. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, uh, now we awarded there is no new power plant start from two thousand new coal power plant yes. start from two thousand twenty two. <laughs> it means there is a <laughs> no, new will be no power plant with the CCUS. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Ma. Uh, that's Indonesia perspective. Uh, Adam, if you, I can also beg you uh, from international experience on this uh, issue as well. <laughs> Please. Yeah, thank you, Benny. And I mean, um, I think every every perspective, of course, coming from 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 an electricity generating authority, um, I think he's already uh, very well covered covered kind of the, the key considerations. I think uh, that that question raises, and I think the key question, uh, like a key aspect that that he touched upon, is is if if you know if if um, there's a change to the technology in the middle of the power purchase agreement uh, period, then, then that does present a complex situation, something that I, I certainly couldn't comment on more uh, thoroughly than he has. Um, but I think trying to maybe bring, um, bring, bring in, in turn, uh, the perspective of if, if this is a retrofit project um, that takes place in the middle of a power purchase agreement, that of course would also present the challenge. Um, and then I think just the last thought kind of um, touching on the point of uh, what kind of policies um, could help to overcome this, this additional cost that including CO2 capture equipment um, would entail in terms of power generation. Um, one, one kind of international example that I could point to is the kind of a contract for different schemes. So something um, that, that uh, the UK is looking at, for example, in their own power sector uh, arrangements. And this is a type of policy designed to kind of really um, address these operational cost differentials that might exist when you, when you look at implementing CCUS in a given sector. Um, and really a CFD does kind of cover the cost differentials between, between production costs um, and, and a market price. Um, so I think really looking at um, how do policies support power producers, um, how do they reward uh, or compensate power producers that are, that are looking um, to incorporate low carbon technologies, um, and in this case, CCUS. Uh, so hopefully complimentary, but, but I think again, uh, I th thank you, Avi, for, for, for your answer. Okay. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, uh, we only have a few minutes left. Um, um, so um, allow me to just uh, conclude with our final uh, session. Um, um, but thanks again for everyone uh, who posting your question. Uh, our team will continue uh, uh, the engagement with the finalists uh, to respond and posting in our website letters. Uh, so as a final one, so if I can invite every uh, business panelist to share your views. I'm not sure whether it's an abstract question, but um, on your point of view, on the short term, medium term or long term, uh, that's um, how you conclude or you, how you view on the role of the CCUS in the low carbon development. Um, globally, or if you can address it in national or ASEAN context, also welcome. So, um, let me just go back in the, uh, the, the order that we have earlier. I'm going to start with the Juho. Thank you, Benny. I, I think the first observation or thought is really that um, I'm absolutely convinced that this is a technology that we will need. There's no question about it. There's so many sectors that don't have other options. So uh, uh, in the power sector, there are options, and that's always going to be a 
then a you know analysis and discussion as to how much CCUS you need there. But some many other sectors, cement, steel, chemicals, uh, upstream, there's just no technology. So first of all, we will need it. I think the second point, uh, and also towards the sort of ASEAN region and countries, um, I think a really healthy first step for every every country would be to 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 make a plan to to properly analyze the question. And uh, I think uh, Marietta alluded that you know Philippines does not yet have a CCUS plan. Fine, that's that's uh, that that would be a starting point to to perhaps do one. Indonesia, I think uh, our first speakers were mentioning that there will be some sort of specific CCS policy or plan. And not all countries have done that, but I think doing a, making an analysis and plan for what CCS can do in your country would be the first best step uh, to, to go from here and then start, start implementing it. That would be my yeah. final thought. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Joe. Then um, I move to Adam, please. Yeah, thank you. So um, thinking again about the short term, medium term, kind of long term um, rollout, if you will. Um, um, so I think looking at the short term, and I think you know we had the idea of the year 2025 or so. In the next few years, um, what really needs to happen to, to accelerate deployment of CCUS in the Southeast Energy uh, Asia uh, region? Um, so I think really the priorities in the short term are, are storage development. Um, and here, really looking at regional cooperation, cooperation, which countries might have storage resources um, that could help to accommodate CO2 captured in others, and, and how can um, this cooperation lead to the development of, of CCUS networks, um, implementing legal and regulatory frameworks for needed, um, and kind of building on something you've always just saying about, um, about including um, CCUS and, and drawing on the example of the Philippines, including CCUS in policies and plans, um, I would um, I would say that inclusion of CCUS in climate and energy strategies and, and critically in nationally determined contributions, so explicitly including CCUS, could actually be um, very important when it comes to the uh, access to, to finance question because um, a lot of a lot of these uh, multilateral um, climate finance uh, sources will actually look to NDCs um, uh, to to assess funding funding requests. So I think that's a good short term kind of uh, set of priorities. Um, the medium term, looking more at the kind of enabling infrastructure, rolling out transportation storage infrastructure. Um, which are, of course, big investments, but at that point, if there are regional cooperation and financing support, um, could, could, um, could be a good medium-term kind of step in the, the 2030-40 range, um, as well as, of course, early deployments in, in some of these retrofit uh, opportunities, projects and retrofits, lower cost deployments in, for example, um, fuel processing sectors. And then finally, um, mid-century, um, really looking at broad deployment of CCUS across all of the relevant sectors, uh, and even beginning um, where possible to look at uh, CCUS as it's applied to carbon removal, so direct air capture, for example. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Adam. That's going to be, um, uh, Paivi, your final thought uh, on, okay. on the CCUS? I just want to say the so statement was uh, UBC in the trilemma energy. Uh, we see there is uh, environmentally sustainability issue, uh, security of supply issue, and affordability issue. In these three issues, the key of the CCUS is more in affordability uh, issue. This means the key of this is innovation and incentive. Yeah. Without innovation and incentive, it's not uh, possible to implement uh, CCUS in uh, our system. It will be uh, interfere the affordability of the community or the government. That's uh, my statement. Right. So, Thank you. Thank you, but uh, Marietta, for your final thought. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, I, I agree with Juho saying that we need a plan. Yes, the, the, our, uh, our energy mix, uh, the role of uh, coal is still uh, important to us, even though we have declared a coal moratorium, but that is just a temporary thing because we still have a lot of power plants that are on uh, that are online so and there are still a lot of coal fired power plants coming on stream but then we have a second thought on the cost that was presented a while ago by adam that uh, we need a 1 billion dollar per year uh, per year for the CCUS and that thing um, may uh, for at this time the Philippines I don't think that uh, that uh, will be uh, affordable to us but then if or if the um, technology is already ripe or like we have like the renewable energy before like the solar when it was first uh, when it was first uh, coming in, uh, the cost was so high, but then it, it has reached its learning curve. Uh, so by that time, maybe the Philippines can consider that. Can consider that. And of course, since it is a low carbon uh, technology, then it could be part, maybe in the long term, but not but not uh, in the immediate term. We can look at that in the long term. There is a possibility for the Philippines because we still need our, we still need, uh, I mean, our renewable energy sources cannot uh, augment the need for electricity because it's, uh, there is a continuing demand until now, even if there is pandemic, we see that uh, electricity still needs, uh, still increasing uh, uh, in spite of the restriction in, the, in 2020, we see that electricity is still, uh, it has not dropped that much. The impact has not dropped that much. So we see that uh, uh, GSG emission will still continue to increase. Uh, I think that's all. Right. So um, thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, we we'll conclude um, our panel discussion um, uh, today. Um, I'm, I'm, I apologize that I'm eating extra time from the schedules, but I do really enjoy the discussion and learn a lot from um, all the experts. Uh, so I'd like to thank Duo uh, and Adam, Pai and Marietta, and also for almost uh, around almost 300 audience who stay with us for this uh, important discussion. Um, sincerely, thank you for us to join uh, the panel discussion. And um, to, uh, next, I will uh, return back to the master ceremony uh, for the closing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Benny, for the excellent moderation. Also, thank you very much to all panelists, Mr. Joho Liponen, Mr. Adam Bavingstern, Mr. Evi Hariadi, Ms. Merida Koitiada, and Ms. Beth Hardy Paliaho for a comprehensive discussion on the role of CTUS in low carbon development in ASEAN. Your knowledge and experience will definitely benefit ASEAN in the development of CCUS in the future. Although I enjoy listening to the very extensive discussion, which I believe all of the audience are feeling the same way, unfortunately, we are reaching the end of the webinar. I saw a lot of questions in the Q&A box that are left unanswered due to time limitations. But rest assured, we will carefully read all questions and discuss it with the panelists and we will upload it to our website. You can also look forward to our next event to discuss more about CCUS. Should you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact us at pfs at ASEANenergy.org. On that note, I would like to thank all of the audience for the active participation in today's webinar and especially to all speakers, starting from the welcoming remarks from Dr. Nuki Agia Utama and Mr. Abdul Razib Dawood, until panel discussion with the amazing panelists and moderator that have shared their insights with us today. I would also like to give a special thanks to Professor Futuka Ariyaji, the Director General of Oil and Gas from the Minister, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources of Indonesia, 
for being able to join us live in our webinar today. We really appreciate the valuable time and effort from all speakers in contributing to the success of the webinar. Before closing this webinar, allow me to share with you a few updates on ACE and ACCEPT upcoming activities. The closest event is the upcoming webinar on Hydrogen in ASEAN, Economic Perspective, Development and Applications, which will be held on August 30th, 2021 at 2 until 4 p.m. Jakarta time. In this webinar, we will launch our report on Hydrogen in ASEAN to provide the initial status of Hydrogen in ASEAN, as well as to further discuss economic prospect and the potential for utilizing Hydrogen in the energy transition in ASEAN. I can assure you that you will not want to miss this webinar as we will invite experts and policymakers to share their views in an epic panel discussion. So don't miss out and register yourself through the link as shown in your screen. My colleague will also help to type it in the chat box so you can access it directly. Next month on September 14th until 17th, 2021, the ASEAN Energy Business Forum 2021 will take place virtually which is held under the chairmanship of the Ministry of Energy, Brunei Darussalam. ASEAN Energy Business Forum, in conjunction with 39th ASEAN Ministers on Energy Meeting, presents the most influential platform containing 10 ASEAN mini Energy Ministers and global energy leaders. This platform enables ASEAN policymakers to showcase national energy framework aspirations and discuss how they could work with businesses to realize these goals thus serving as the perfect platform to foster in country investment missions, bilateral meetings between project owners, investors, and integrated energy solutions partners. For further information, you can access the link shown in your screen or simply click on the link that will be provided by my colleague in the chat box. Last but not least, ACE is inviting all researchers to submit the abstract of your research to the first ASEAN International Conference on Energy and Environment. This event will be held on September 15, 2021, which is co-hosted with Brunei Darussalam in conjunction with IIDF 2021. The submission deadline is extended to August 15. We're hoping that this initiative could be a platform for triple helix collaboration for research activities with the main topic of ASEAN energy transition with resiliency in the post-pandemic climate change era. For more details, please check the event page or also email at AICEE info at ASEANenergy.org. My colleague will provide both link and email in the chat box. Today's webinar is endorsed by the ASEAN Climate Change and Energy Project, or as we call it, ACCEPT. One of ACCEPT's initiate activities is the ASEAN Researchers Network on Energy and Climate Change, or ARNEC. It is a group of scholars, analysts, and other stakeholders gathered in an interdisciplinary forum for the discussion on social, economic, governance, and technical issues related to energy and climate change. If you are interested, you can register via the link on the far right. For more details on the project, you could also access our various social media as shown in your screen. Distinguished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen, now we have reached the end of the webinar. Once again, on behalf of the ASEAN Center for Energy, I would like to thank all speakers and participants for the great comprehensive discussion today. I hope you all stay safe, stay healthy, and see you on our next event. Bye-bye. Thank you.